This week, Military Collectors is on the move to Tallahassee, Florida. I found a dedicated group who are restoring vintage military helicopters. We got this and a whole lot more on this week's episode of Military Collectors. Roger that. On this week's Military Collectors, we found a very special site in North Florida and a collector who loves the Huey helicopter and a bunch of others. But before I introduce my guest this week, we're going to take a look back at the history of the UH-1 Huey helicopter. In 1952, the United States Army identified a requirement for a new helicopter to serve as medical evacuation, instrument trainer, and general utility aircraft. Twenty companies submitted designs, and Bell Helicopter won the contract, and they produced 100 aircraft, which was designated as the HU-1A, and officially named Iroquois, after the Native American nations. The helicopter quickly developed a nickname derived from its designation of HU-1, which came to be pronounced as Huey. The Huey first entered service with the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the 82nd Airborne Division, and the 57th Medical Detachment. The Huey helicopter arrived in Vietnam in 1962, and as a result of the Vietnam War, it has become one of the most recognized helicopters in the world. In Vietnam, the Huey carried out missions that included general support, air assault, cargo transport, aeromedical evacuation, search and rescue, electronic warfare, and later ground attack. Hueys also had different names depending on how they were outfitted. Gunships were referred to as frogs or hogs if they carried rockets and cobras if they had guns. If the Huey was configured for troop transport, they were referred to as slicks due to absence of weapon pods. During the war, 7,013 Hueys served in Vietnam and of those, 3,305 were destroyed. The U.S. Army phased out the Huey with the introduction of the Black Hawk helicopter. Even though it was used until 2005 for support and training and in use in selected Army National Guard units, the Huey was officially retired from active Army service in 2005. The Huey helicopter was the mostly used military helicopter to date and was the most famous helicopter of the 20th century. My guest this week on Military Collectors is Kevin Vislocki. He is the collector in North Florida that we spoke about earlier and he is an aviator and he's just absolutely nuts over the Huey helicopter and a bunch of others. Kevin, I tell you what, thank you so much for having us down to this beautiful collection, okay? And I know folks may be expecting to see airframes that are ready to go and the whine of the Huey, but you know, let's talk first about you and how you got started collecting these and then I want to talk a little bit about the history of this, this bird that's behind us. Okay. Well, I'll have to admit it, it's somewhat of a sickness that I've developed, developed through the years. Um, I, for my career, I was a pilot. I, I flew various aircraft, one of which I was fortunate enough to fly the Huey for a while. Uh, and I retired in 2012 and wanted to continue on with that disease of, of, of being around aircraft. And uh, I made my wife a little bit upset with me. Uh, I used some of my uh, sick leave pay that I received from, from the my, my career, and I bought this aircraft uh, from a museum that uh, had it. And this particular aircraft is a, a Mike model Huey. Uh, it, it was a gunship uh, used in Vietnam. Uh, when that museum picked it up, it had a, a, quite a history. It started out uh, in Vietnam, uh, flew combat missions and some, uh, some excellent uh, combat missions as far as history and, and the lives that were saved and, and so forth. Um, after it uh, flew through uh, Vietnam, it, un unlike a lot of Hueys that stayed in the country or destroyed, uh, this one was brought back to the United States and rebuilt on, in Aberdeen. And ultimately NASA picked it up and flew it for 10 years in Florida for uh, security purposes for the space shuttle program. And after that, unfortunately, it was auctioned off to the public and a helicopter agricultural firm bought it and cannibalized it and cannibalized it terribly. They took it down to basically just an airframe. And a museum picked it up uh, after that 
and um, I, I met an individual and uh, acquired the helicopter here and uh, started trying to put this back together for display. It will, it will never be able to fly again because there's some restraints on this type of airframe with the Federal Aviation Administration. But the idea was to put it back into its original configuration as it was in Vietnam doing its service. Uh, and subsequently to that, um, we created a uh, nonprofit organization uh, which allowed us to uh, bring in other aircraft and other folks that had interest in doing this. And uh, now we are restoring several aircraft and, and vehicles and so forth. And our, our purpose in doing this is basically to save these iconic airframes uh, and also vehicles uh, that showcase what our veterans had to use while they were protecting our country. And to also showcase the sacrifices that our veterans made while performing their duties in these aircraft and vehicles. Just the idea that that history is being preserved and this is not ending up in a, in a, a junkyard or a smelter, um, to me, it means the world. Well, you know, Kevin, and one of the key pieces that I think is so important as we travel around the country and feature collectors just like you is we try to portray the passion, okay? And that is one of the things that, that has really made over for me the idea of not only because I do vehicles and other things, and I love it, but for the general public folks, folks that didn't serve, and, and, and that's okay, and, and that's a great thing, because it doesn't, you don't have to be a military collector in order to serve in the military, you just have to have an appreciation for history of this country, whatever it may be, and, and you guys here at the foundation have done that. And that's really special. I, I, I just can't say enough about what you're doing here and your group uh, to restore these things for the veterans uh, who flew them. And, and I really think that's special. Well, I, I think it, our, our, the name of our organization says it all, Military Machines of American Freedom, because these iconic machines, whether it's aircraft or vehicles, they are our freedom. Our veterans use these tools to gain our freedom and preserve our freedom. And to me, that, that means the world. Stay tuned. When we come back from commercial break, we take a look at another Huey helicopter restoration project. If you have missed any past episodes of Military Collectors, be sure to go online at militarycollectorstv.com and you can see not only past episodes, but also read in-depth features on the people and their passion of their military collections. Every soldier's training is the same, but their story is their own. From the fields of Gettysburg to the tanks rolling across the sands of Kuwait, the story of the mounted soldier is a story of mobility, speed, and the historic power to shift the mighty tides of war. The National Armor and Cavalry Heritage Foundation is asking for your help in keeping the legacy of the United States Armor and Cavalry and telling the stories for many years to come. Unforgettable memories begin the moment you pick up your first Browning. With unmatched security, fire protection, and storage options, Browning will be with you through a lifetime, protecting your guns and all the cherished memories you make with them. Keep your Browning memories safe. Take a moment to think about the food you buy and eat. Is it fresh? I mean really fresh. Or is it shipped from a grower hundreds or even thousands of miles away? Well, here in South Carolina, we celebrate fresh, locally grown food and unforgettable meals with family and friends. So choose food that's rooted right here. Choose certified SC grown. It's a matter of taste. Welcome back to Military Collectors. Joining me again is Kevin Vislaki here at the Foundation and the restoration of these helicopters. We've got another one that he's going to talk about, and this one really has a special story, okay? And, well, for all you aviators out there, uh, this might surprise you that this one may fly again soon, actually. Kevin, 
Tell me about this this airframe because again, this has another different model uh, and the potential for it to be restored to fly. Yes, uh, this particular aircraft we acquired from the Department of State. It was originally destined to go to Pakistan, uh, but ch plans changed and it was put up to the surplus market and we were able to acquire it. This is an H model Huey, which was a troop transport, otherwise known as a slick uh, in, in the Vietnam era. This particular aircraft, we're, we're repainting it uh, to commemorate the 116th attack helicopter squadron for the Hornets. And our goal on this one is to actually put it back into the air someday and actually fly it at air shows and so forth uh, because this one uh, is actually in very good condition overall mechanically and we hope to, to fly it again to uh, help uh, in our programs of uh, uh, showing this to the public and also sharing it with the veterans and so forth that flew it in Vietnam and their families. Well, and you personally and the foundation are all as well connected to another organization that actually has flyable airframes. Yes, and sir. so, and they're headquartered out of Atlanta, and that's going to be another military collector show. We're going to feature Kevin on that some later time. But let's talk about the state of which you got this, okay? I mean, did, did it have all the gauges? Did it have the, the, the engine? I mean, w w what was there and what was not there? And what do you guys got to do to this? Unfortunately, uh, a lot of this aircraft had been disassembled. Uh, they had removed transmission, rotor blades, tail rotor blades, drive shafts, and so forth. Uh, we were very fortunate in that it had a zero-time engine, a T-53 engine, which is a big bonus. Uh, a lot of the instruments had been removed, but since that, uh, we acquired it uh, approximately a year and a half ago. We, we've acquired all the necessary pieces, rotor blades, instruments, and so forth to put it back into condition. And we're slowly putting it back together mechanically and then we'll ultimately repaint this into its proper configuration, what it looked like in the military. Well, and again, what folks don't realize is is the sensitivity of trying to make these fly again. How hard is that? It, it's actually very difficult. It's a very expensive process. Um, the mechanics of it are fairly straightforward, but everything has to be inspected. Uh, it has to be certified as a proper part before you can put people in it. Our intention is not to fly passengers in it, but just to appear at air shows and, and move it through air shows and so forth. Uh, like our other aircraft, uh, we'll have another, uh, we hope to have an OH-58 in flying status in, in our future. Uh, our other helicopters uh, will be static display only. They'll be moved on trailers and so forth for uh, static disc demonstrations. Well, I'd like for you to do one more thing for me before we close out this segment. Folks, bear with us here because, again, I have spent many of an hour. I'm not an aviator, but I was an infantry guy that rode in these during my career. And I want Kevin to do something for me. I want you to hit the switch. And I want all the viewers out there to hear that whine. And you'll know it'll bring back those memories just like it did for me in our pre-visit here when he did it earlier. So, would you do that for me? Absolutely. Huh? Okay. Well, Kevin, thank you for doing this because, again, there's no other sound like the buttons as they turn on a Huey to get ready to start the engines. Although I sat back there during my career, mostly. Um, and even, I'll have to tell you this story, too, real quick. The guy that always sat there was when I was the aide de camp to the commander of the 101st Airborne. He was still flying. And, of course, uh, his IP pilot, Mel, was in this left seat. And I was always behind in the head seat, and I never will ever forget uh, the sound. And folks, I, I want you to listen to this too, because many of you all veterans out there, there's no other sound like the switches coming on in a Huey helicopter. Can we do it? All right. Mm. And with that sound, then the rotors would start to turn, Pilots to start checking gauges, switches. I mean, it was just, it, it brought back so many memories for me, Kevin, uh, as well. And I'm not even an aviator, and so. That, and that's the sound that all the veterans that flew in this remember. And they do. When we return to Military Collectors, we talk to a Vietnam veteran who flew many combat missions with a Huey helicopter. For 50 years, Ranger Boats has been paying tribute to America's armed forces and their families, not only in the United States, but those men and women who serve all over the world. At Ranger Boats, we appreciate the dedication that these men and women do each and every day, protecting and preserving the very foundations of our freedom. Ranger Boats wants to give back to America's real heroes with our Operation Troop Salute program. 
For more information, visit rangerboats.com today. We all depend on trucks. Chevy. Chevy. Chevy trucks. We think it's because Chevrolets are the most dependable, dependable, dependable trucks. Built to last a long, long time. With durable, durability, and rugged, ruggedness. I like the extra power. Pulling power. Messy power. And quality. Seems they make them strong. With extra strong. Mile after mile after mile. If you are interested in preserving and collecting military vehicles, whether you're a military veteran or just have a love for military vehicles in general, then you may be interested in joining the Military Vehicle Preservation Association. The MVPA is dedicated to providing an international organization for military vehicle enthusiasts. For more information and all the benefits a member receives with joining the Military Vehicle Preservation Association, go online at mvpa.org. Join me on this segment of Military Collectors as a special guest this week. And talking about Army aviation and the Huey helicopter, I've got a guy that flew it in Vietnam, had over 2,500 hours as a slick pilot, or as many of you all may know it as a, as a lift pilot during Vietnam, is John McDonald, uh, a former officer, uh, infantry guy, so he and I can relate. But we thought it was a special occasion to bring this guest on this week to talk about the Huey helicopter and his experiences there. And, you know, again, the foundation, the Military Machines of American Freedom Foundation, he is a board member and also one of the backdrop guys that actually puts the expertise back in restoring these beautiful Hueys. I got to thank you for your service thank you, and Bob. all of your service behind the stick of one of these machines. Tell me a little bit about your history. How did how did you get there? Okay, Vietnam. It's late '60s. Uh, what was what was that like back then? I, I graduated from Florida State University here in Tallahassee and received my commission there, and was guaranteed flight school out of uh, Florida State. So, like you, I went to officer basic school for the infantry and then right to flight school at Fort Walters, Texas. And after Fort Walters, everyone went to Fort Rucker where you received your advanced training and got your wings. After that, it was off to Vietnam. Well, you know, I know all aviators, of course, now go through Mother Rucker at some point. And right. so having been down there and, and seeing all that, it, it just, I know this airframe is very special to you, yes. okay? and and. The amount of hours that you spent, not only flying, but you know the stories that you could tell. What are the memorable things? What is the most memorable time that you could tell all of our viewers out there behind the stick of this airplane? This aircraft is uh, used for a lot of different pur purposes. We uh, obviously took combat troops into uh, into action, but also for the most part, it was our uh, dust-off helicopter. It was what picked the pilots up or the the people from the ground and take them back. Uh, this was the air ambulance. It uh, it did that mission very well. One of my favorite missions, though, is an inner service mission that I got to do with the Navy SEALs. Navy SEALs had a very special mission in Vietnam. Nothing that we can talk about. In fact, they didn't even tell us what they were going to do. They gave us a point on the map. They said, "Take me here." We dropped the full team off. They said, "Go up and wait 20 minutes." We went up 3,000 feet, circled for 20 minutes, came back. They didn't say a word. We picked them up at a designated spot, took them back, and you never saw them again. Wow. They didn't use uniforms. They used non-uniform uh, type weapons, but they had a mission to do, and it was great. Well, and, and you know, that's one of the great things about this particular helicopter during that era. Uh, it, it was truly utility. Uh, yes. I mean, from gunships to slick lift, uh, escort, medevac, all of that. And of course, again, and it well into the country today, uh, around the world, these airplanes uh, are still flying. Yes, they are. Uh, after I retired from the military, I uh, got the opportunity to fly for the state of Florida in law enforcement where we were able to get a Huey helicopter, restore it, and fly it with the state of Florida and use it with uh, the Fish and Wildlife SWAT team, which was a great, great advantage for them 
to be able to go all over the state and have this uh, asset. But for me to get back into Huey after not being out of it for about 30 years was uh, you, it's priceless. <laughs> If you have missed any past episodes of Military Collectors, be sure to go online at militarycollectorstv.com and you can see not only past episodes, but also read in-depth features on the people and their passion of their military collections. We all depend on trucks. Chevy. Chevy. Chevy trucks. We think it's because Chevrolets are the most dependable, dependable, dependable trucks. Built to last a long, long time. With durable, durability, and rugged ruggedness, I like the extra power, pulling power, messy power, and quality. Seems they make them strong with extra strong, mile after mile after mile. Every soldier's training is the same, but their story is their own. From the fields of Gettysburg to the tanks rolling across the sands of Kuwait, the story of the mounted soldier is a story of mobility, speed, and the historic power to shift the mighty tides of war. The National Armor and Cavalry Heritage Foundation is asking for your help in keeping the legacy of the United States Armor and Cavalry and telling the stories for many years to come. When is the last time you traced your roots, not your family's roots? The roots of the food you eat, those roots should run deep not from afar. Just like the legacy of farmers here in South Carolina. Day in, day out, farmers from every corner of our state are carrying on the traditions of bringing locally grown food to your table. So, choose food that's rooted right here. Choose certified SC grown. It's a matter of taste. Roger that. Welcome back to Military Collectors. Kevin Vislocki is also a passionate collector of other stuff besides airplanes. And so I thought it was kind of, well, unique and that sort of thing that he's got these C's, S-E-E, -E, small engineer excavator that he's gotten through the surplus system. But we're going to talk about, you're also the rest of this army green sickness that you have. Yes, but you know, uh, these things are unique. And I, these came on during my early days. Uh, the engineers got these things, man, they put the D-ring and D-handled shovel away and they were happy to get these things. So, but you know, in the surplus system, you know, these cost the government almost $95,000 a piece. Yes, sir. Uh, they were made by Mercedes-Benz and again, most of all engineer units had these. And so tell me about this particular one, Kev, because you, you've got three available, but just, let's talk a little bit about this one. This particular one is somewhat unique. Uh, it is also part of the excavator type uh, chassis. Same Unimog made by Mercedes-Benz. Right. But this one had a uh, forklift attachment on it, and it was designed for uh, field use. Uh, this can be adjusted if, if you're in rough terrain, it can be adjusted to go over um, you know, obstacles and so forth, which is unique to a forklift. Uh, but also on the back of this is very unique. It has uh, an articulating crane system. Okay. And like all of these, uh, they're designed to travel down the road approximately 55 miles per hour. Right. Uh, and yet when you get on location, this mechanism folds out into a normal crane type of system. And in this case, it's, it's a three-arm crane, uh, lifts approximately 4,000 pounds, and it's fully articulating. It was designed primarily for moving everything from uh, cargo, uh, ammunition boxes, and so forth. Uh, but it's very, uh, like I said, articulate in, in the, its ability to move fairly uh, close areas and so forth. And it was very useful for uh, the, the type of operation. Well, see, as an infantry guy, uh, we were always jealous of the engineers because you know we were still stuck with a d-handled shovel but we were always glad when these guys showed up because again uh, not only did they help move some of the engineering material and some of the ammo and stuff especially in the rear area uh, and the support groups but then let's walk over here and talk about the other one which really uh, kind of modernized engineer units in the field because you know back during the 80s and the height of the cold war it was always about digging in and it was about the soviets and you know we had to have uh, hull down uh, positions for not only our tow weapon systems and that sort of thing and not that it's a lot different today 
but this thing came on board man we 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 could we could put together a position in a heartbeat from trenches for infantry guys uh humvees with tow mounts tanks you name it the engineers could do it with one of these a very capable machine uh, as you know it has a bucket on the front just like a bulldozer yeah uh, fully articulating also there. But one of the neatest things about this vehicle is it has a hydraulic system. It's all self-contained and there's approximately 50 feet of hose on the other side that you could attach these implements. That included a chainsaw, hydraulic uh, controlled chainsaw, uh, auger, and, and also a jackhammer system. So you could break up concrete, cut down trees, um, and w on the back is a a regular case manufactured backhoe. Yep. This is a standard case, and uh, as you said, they would uh, dig trenches, uh, do encampments, and so forth with this. But the biggest thing, again, is it was self-contained. It could get to a, a remote area, and just with what the tools and implements it had, it could do a lot of work, more so than individuals could. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this week's edition of Military Collectors. We'll check back with Kevin and all his groups sometime later and see if they've got any of those vintage Huey helicopters flying again. I know those guys are going to put it all together one day, and those things will be back in the air. Again, we'll see you next time on another episode of Military Collectors.